Okay. Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start now. Um, I'm going to hit mute all. So just going to warn you now. Give me one second. Good idea. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sounds like we're all muted now. Oh, righty. Let me just make all sure. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. We're, in, we're recording. So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Dr. Yasmeen Farshad. I'm the Practitioner Education Manager here at Wise Woman Herbals. And I want to welcome you to the very first practitioner call through the Wise Woman Herbals Learning Community. We're so excited to provide a space for all practitioner types to come together, share their appreciation for the herbs while deepening their knowledge in botanical medicine. We're very happy to have you as part of our community and our very first event. Today's presentation is entitled The New Faces of Bitters by Dr. Glenn Nagel. Bitters have long been used by herbalists and naturopathic doctors for supporting healthy digestion. In the next 60 minutes, Dr. Nagel will share some detailed information with you about how bitters work, current research, clinical indications, and contraindications, as well as exciting new research on the role of bitters um, on the role bitters play in cardiovascular health, blood sugar regulation, and weight management. Dr. Nagel has been a practicing herbalist registered through the American Herbalist Guild since 1984 and is also a naturopathic physician. He's deeply passionate about botanical education and believes in teaching with humor while allowing students to learn directly from the plants. He's a former associate professor of botanical medicine at National College of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, a former assistant professor at Bastyr University uh, in Kenmore, Washington. He's currently an adjunct professor at National <coughs> University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, and a consultant to er in the herbalist industry. Now, Dr. Nagel is extremely knowledgeable about botanical medicine, so I highly encourage all participants today to take advantage of this opportunity to ask him any questions you may have um, during the call. And you can actually do so by typing in your questions in the Zoom chat box, and that should be at the very bottom of your screen. Um, you can do that at any point during the presentation. We'll address as many of the, of the inquiries as we go, and then at the very end, whatever questions are left, we'll be happy to answer them as well. Everyone who attended today will be receiving a special promotion at the very end. Um, it's a 15% off of your next wholesale purchase, so stay tuned at, uh, for that at the very end. And now I would like to present today's, uh, I would like to welcome today's presenter, Dr. Glenn Nagel. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, can you guys see my slides, the PowerPoint slides? I can see them. Okay. The blue one. Well, I appreciate being on this call and I'm excited about this opportunity because, you know, using the technology, we can all come together for an hour. And the way I envision this format is really presenting some ideas that are interesting to me that I think herbally you may find interesting. Um, give you a kind of an overview of some, I'm condensing a bit like a two hour bitter lecture into about 35 minutes but then give you a time to have a dialogue with me so we can do questions and answers. And I appreciate um, you guys all getting up this morning. Um, this webinar is sponsored by Wise Women, but the content is all me. So I'm giving you my opinion, my belief, my understanding, my clinical experience. And so what's exciting is that as herbalists, as practitioners, as naturopathic physicians, we uh, all bring different things to the table. And so I'm excited to learn as much as to be the presenter in these formats. You will also be getting a copy of these slides so and the format uh, re resources so eventually you can get more detailed. Some of my slides are rather detailed because they're kind of note taking, um, but feel free to take notes. Uh, I'm Dr. Glenn Nagel, I'm a naturopathic physician. Uh, I use the concept of the herbal wise guy. Uh, the model really is that plants are here so much to support us. And I'm really excited about uh, sharing some of these things that I can with you. And so let's get started. And so we're starting on this concept of, is there a bitter deficiency syndrome? Well, we know that there are epidemics today of and I'll just bring all these slides in. There's epidemics today of type two diabetes, of alcohol, uh, of obesity, a syndrome X, uh, high blood pressure, lipid abnormalities, 
And you know, if many of you are practitioners and are following the current scientific thinking, really comes all down to sugar. We're not designed to eat that much sugar, but is the break to sugar or is there a balance to sugar intake by bitters? And herbalists have all known, if you're a practitioner or an herbalist, your family would say, yeah, everything they make tastes horrible, right? Because plants are bitter. And if I ask students to just go out and grab some herb, the chances of that herb being bitter are very high. And so in medicinal plants, bitters are really, really common. But in society, you know, you think about the old salad before a meal, well, or after a meal. Well, salad greens, if you've ever grown your own lettuce, by the time they get mature, they get very bitter. And so bitters are long been used, I think, as an antidote traditionally to sugar. And so we're going to present some information and some research that talks about specifically from the old model of what we know about bitters, but more likely some new things that you might not be aware of, of how bitters can be helpful in cardiovascular disease, lipid abnormalities, cholesterol issues, and blood sugar. And so, yes, we have all these concerns today. You know, uh, I, I think about my basic physiology. There's like five or six ways to raise blood, uh, but only two ways to lower blood sugar. And so we're kind of hardwired not to have sugar. And if you think of their approach now of the paleo diet, the keto diet, it's all about lowering sugar. And that goes back to kind of how we're hardwired. And so as we talk about uh, bitter, I love this concept, although the picture of the tongue, it's not 100% true, but we have receptors all over the body and the tongue is where they're really highlighted and the bitter receptors are mostly on the back of the tongue and that's really interesting because how many times have you taken something bitter and tasted like if I had some bitter tea here and I dig a sip I'd be like hey this is pretty good and as soon as I say good it tastes bitter so nature's hardwired us that I think we need bitter so the bitter receptors are on the back of the tongue so that by the time we taste them, we've already swallowed them. We also have sweet, sour, salty, umami. And so these five basic tastes, actually, um, the, one of the research studies we'll talk about is that the bitter receptors and some of the sweet umami receptors may have effects on blood sugar. We're gonna focus on the bitters today. So we know they're on the tongue, but they're also found all throughout the body. This is a really great detailed slide. I'm not gonna go through it in, in great detail, but it basically shows you the chemistry of how bitter receptors stimulate your brain and basically then stimulate directly um, afferent nerves like cranial nerves seven, nine, and 10. And so what, one thing you wanna look at is this bitter receptor. There's ligands in bitter plants and they stimulate afferent nerves, and they're actually what we call G-coupled proteins. And G-coupled proteins are these incredible um, sensing agents all over the body. And so what we have to think of bitter receptors now as like chemosensing agents. And um, they're involved with taste, but you can also have a bitter experience without tasting them. And that's why swallowing bitter things also have effects throughout the body and the digestive tract. The other piece that's real interesting about G-coupled proteins is that other systems use G-coupled proteins, and the most common now is all the cannabinoids are affected by G-coupled proteins. And so this is a sensing system. The, um, the endocannabinoid system is a G-coupled pr protein system, and the bitters is a G-coupled protein system. And so these are um, hugely uh, d diverse in the human body. Um, this is a detailed slide from the clinical therapeutic study 2013, but they basically say that taste gets signaled into chemicals and then it gets signaled into a physiology and reflexes. And so the bitter reflex is a sensing taste agent and affects physiology. And so there's quite a few number of bitter receptors. This slide comes from a research article that shows you there's umami receptors, T1R1s and T1R3s. There's sweet receptors, T1R2s and T1R3s. And then the bitter receptors, which 
there's 30 and some references I've seen as many as 60 um, T2Rs, which taste to R receptors. And these have different names. And so if you look down this list, willow um, has salicin. Willow bark is extremely bitter if you've ever tasted the herb or the extract. And that has the TR16 receptors. Um, there's components from atropine, from the belladonna family, strychnine, which also have bitter receptors. And so what we're trying to dial in, I think, today is we're talking about bitters in a general way. But I think the future of bitters, what I'm leading information is that eventually we're going to find certain botanical bitters have certain physiological effects on certain parts of the body. And my analogy now is really like um, acidophilus. We used to be like, you know, yogurt, it's all good. And now we know there's specific strains to help women. There's specific strains to help obesity. There's specific strains for bowel disorders. And I think eventually we're going to find that. But now when we talk about bitters, we still don't know no, enough about which receptors. And so again, these are the G-coupled proteins in the cell membranes. They're stim stimulated by bitter ligands in plants. And uh, the concept of tasting bitters is important for the oral effect, but eventually sensing them throughout the body is important. So here's some of the different bitter receptors. Um, you can see they go from 48, 16, so they're all different components. And so some of these are from plants like the salicin, and some are toxins. And that's one of the initial theories is bitters were toxins. And if something's bitter, we would spit it out and save ourselves being poisoned. But if that was true, why are the bitter receptors on the back of the tongue? And so my sense is that uh, bitters can represent toxins, but they can also have a, a hugely positive effect. And so uh, we'll go through some of the sourcing. Now, if you look at this slide, it's a little hard to see, but you can blow it up. All these little yellow dots are where they're bitter type two receptors. And so there's some in the mouth and tongue, of course. Oh, there's some lining the esophagus. Do you taste anything in your esophagus? No. So once you swallow it, taste is gone, but there's still stimulation of the receptors. And so this is the idea that I've changed my mind that everything that tastes bitter will work for digestion, but also swallowing bitter capsules, bitter tablets can have an effects without the bitter taste. And that's, I think, a new um, model that you don't just have to taste the bitters, but you have to get them in the system. So throughout the stomach, um, the liver, gallbladder, bile duct, rectum, they're out, and they're also found heavily in the lungs, in the bronchi, in the placenta, in the thyroid. Now I'm not going to talk a lot about thyroid, but the new bitter model says that bitter uh, can be bitters can be helpful for thyroid disorders both hypo and hyperthyroid. So now we're starting to say, hey, you know, beyond the initial. So here's um, a, an article about recepting bitter receptors T2R38. These are found all over the placenta. So why are there bitter receptors in the placenta? Well, in this article, they theorize that those receptors may be involved with um, infection and so bacteria may make components that the placenta can uh, sense and then cause immune response. This is a great article that talks about the overview about taste, that it isn't for taste buds anymore. And this talks about uh, the G-coupled proteins and that these are important nutritional supplement. So I start thinking of bitters like uh, essential nutrients, you know, like a vitamin, like a mineral, like essential fatty acid and bitters. And so one of the models I'll talk about in using bitter, bitters is I think of it like something you would put on the table, salt, pepper, maybe not sugar, but bitters. And that's a really great way to get people into bitters is, oh, I'm going to eat something sweet. I'm going to use bitters. And so this article says that, suggests that taste transduction Transduction cascade is not restricted to taste, but the receptors mediating taste are evolved early. So this is one of the things is really early on we developed these chemo detection system. And that's a really great thing to think about it. It's not just bitter, but it's a chemo detection system. 
these natural ligands are non-gustatory, meaning they don't just work in the taste. So this is a great article. I'm giving you uh, in the notes all the references for the articles. And you can go to PubMed and read the articles, and it's really great to understand. Uh, what is the history of bitters? Well, there's a really long history in drinks. Uh, I mean, you think about anybody goes to a bar and you can make a, a medicinal drink without any alcohol or very little alcohol. Ask for bubbly water with bitters. That's what you, you can drink because the bitters, as in Angostura bitters, and now in this Portland model where I live, there's all kinds of high-end bitters. But anything that tastes bitter, we can classify as a bitter. There's bitters that are super bitter, or what we call pure bitters, and then there's aromatic bitters. And so this old concept is they affect digestion and they stimulate digestion as a aperitif, a digestive. So either before the meals or after the meals. This is another thing I've changed my mind on. I used to always say take them 20, 20 minutes before a meal, uh, especially capsules. But now uh, you can take them after the meal and they still have effects. I think the uh, thing about after the meal is some people might be able to get a little reflex and burp them up and taste bitter. So wedge them in the meal, before the meal. This really helps patient compliance if you just say, take them. And so, you know, before the meal or after meal, they're both going to help stimulate digestion. And this is the historical model about bitters. I love this old saying about bitters. Sweet to the taste buds, bitter to the stomach, bitter to the tongue, then sweet to the stomach. And so essentially bitters sweeten the digestive tract. They stimulate acid production and they promote digestive enzymes. And so hi historically as people age, food becomes harder to digest. You know, you think about acid production, whether it's people have excessive acid or too little acid, Bitters can be a tonic to help stimulate that. And the way I like to think of it is bitters kind of have a cold and downward action. And this is my little analogy is like, if this is my stomach fire, you can see my fingers representing the stomach and those little acids are being secreted and then food's coming down and it gets into the acid. What bitters really try to do is they're kind of cold and downward. And so what they try to do is put out the acid. But because this is a physiological activity, meaning the bitters will affect the vis, the body's own inherent wisdom. And so if you try to put out the fire, it stimulates more fire. And so that's one of the ways the bitters work. And that's why small doses work, is they allow your body to respond against the bitters. And a great example I had a number of years ago is I had this patient working with students and he was older and, and he had a digestive issue and we thought bitters would be helpful. We gave him a tincture of bitters and this, somehow we got the dose wrong and he took like two dropperfuls in water. And then he, as he swallowed it, he was like, this is horrible. And then like 30, uh, maybe 10 to 30 seconds later, he threw it all up. And so this idea that if you put too much bitters, the body responds by reversing. And so a little bit of bitters really helps stimulate digestion. And this is a concept I call physiological dosing. This is how many herbs work. They don't work through pharmacological dosing. They work by manipulating your physiology, allowing your own vis, your own inherent life force to stimulate digestion. And so bitters are the beginning model for helping digestive acid. You could start with bitters, you can move up to uh, vinegar, uh, lemon juice, then digestive enzymes and acid supplements. But bitters are the most basic and the simplest and the easiest for almost every, anybody to take. And so a lot of patients are taking digestive enzymes and you would be like, you know, bitters might be the first place to start. So digestive tract, this is the traditional indications. They were all digestive, low acid, low appetite, nausea, diarrhea, constipation. Although bitters can cause any of those. The general idea around bitters is they stimulate digestion and they can cause uh, stools to move through quicker. So that would be the one big concern. Malnutrition, weakness, uh, coating on the tongue, white or yellow, <coughs> poor digestion, depressive moods and disorders. You gotta remember, <coughs> without acid, 
You don't get your protein absorbed and your proteins, amino acids, amino acids form serotonin. So the number one problem you see when people are on acid blocking drugs is mineral deficiency and mood disorders because they, they, they get unhappy because their serotonin brain chemistry is blocked. So bitters can be a really good way for people to transition off those acid blocking drugs. Um, contraindications, you know, generally acute inflammation, ulcers, you know, anything that's actively inflamed because this is uh, something that stimulates uh, acid. Um, in pregnancy, you know, especially in the third trimester, it's, you know, it's a downward type of energy. The bitters are cold and downward. And so that, that would be contraindicated in pregnancy. Ask your f personal physician about that one. <clears throat> and generally children, although, you know, children, you give them something bitter, they, they can smell it a mile away. And so kids are kind of hardwired for sugar because they're growing. And so it's rare case that kids under 12 need bitters, but there is a new, you know, epidemic of childhood obesity and all that and diabetes where bitters can be helpful. But generally under five, it's unlikely the kids are going to need bitters. I don't think there's any big health concern. It's just try getting it into them. Generally, they are not able to swallow till after five anyway. So. so these would be true for almost all bitters, although practitioner to practitioner, you can find a um, small amount of bitters. is probably not going to be problematic for almost anybody. I'm not going to go into the, um, the main differences here, but we have the true bitters, which are only bitter. And the one that we really talk about the most is gentian. Gentian and centurium are in the same family. Gentian is the root. It's mostly grown in Europe. It's sustainable. It's super bitter. You can dilute it a lot. Uh, these hydrasses, Oregon grape, the bitter aloe, which is the latex from aloe, uh, jo uh, eupatorium, bone set, um, bog bean, chinchona, quassia. Then the aromatic bitters, these are really popular in formulations like wormwood and yarrow and hops. You know, hops is the classic aromatic bitter. It's put in beer, has the flavor, but it also, the bitters um, keep the beer from being fermented. And so it was used to um, stabilize the beer. And then we just got used to the great taste. And if you like IPAs, Indian Pale Ale, they're double the triple hopped because on the long boat ride from England, they would um, turn to vinegar. And so hops prevented that. And so that's one of the antimicrobial effects of the bitter. <clears throat> and then the other thing you have to think about is that bitters often have with them prebiotics, which is, you know, the sugars. The most famous one is inulin. And the uh, uh, Oregon grape has a little bit, but taraxacum and burdock and artichoke there's a really good source um, you know like the uh, the famous example would be Jerusalem artichoke which in my mind is Jerusalem fartichoke because if you eat it you will get so much pre prebiotics that it just makes a lot of gas but those are found in bitter so if you have a tincture of taraxacum it's bitter but it also has prebiotics in it and prebiotics help the gut by giving the food for the good bacteria so we're focused a lot on bacteria when we're thinking about gut health, but if we focus on the food, the right ones will find a home. So the current theory about digestion, and I would say current, but this is maybe the historical model, is that to get better digestion, you get response from the bitters. They increase the secretions of acid. They um, have an effect on the vagal nerve, and the vagus nerve stimulates the cranial nerves what would say 9, 10, and 11. The alcohol also without bitters has a stimulation on digestion. So an alcoholic form of bitters is kind of like a double whammy that bitters themselves, alcohol improves digestion because it's warming and it's penetrating. And so one thing you have to remember about all tinctures is alcohol is a driving agent. It's also a solvent, but a little bit of alcohol sends the, um, plant constituents right in the bloodstream, right in the tongue and mouth, and right through the stomach. And it also increases blood flow. And so bitters stimulate blood flow. There's a couple of studies out there about gentian 
um, and I know it's more than one, gentian roots slowing down um, appetite. And so gentian bitters can actually help decrease calorie intake. And it just seems like people are more satisfied, they absorb their food mo more, and they want less food. Um, the new bit, bit, bitter uh, response is um, more through this slide. Is we'll talk about blood sugar support and the incretin effect. I've been called the incretin. Uh, no, um, the probiotics. We talked about that. There, there's areas that it can help with lipids and metabolic syndrome. Uh, studies show it decreased cravings for alcohol, which is what I've been told the bartender's secret is that you want people, you want to go home, it's two o'clock in the morning, you put extra bitters the last hour in all the drinks, and people sober up and want to go home. You have to remember that bitters are like the opposite to sweets, and alcohol is more sugar than sweets. You got to remember that old idea that uh, every, um, there's four calories per gram of sugar, and there's seven calories per gram of alcohol and nine calories per gram of fats. So alcohol is like a, a purified form of sugar. And so when you're drinking alcohol, you're getting converting it eventually into sugar or uh, triglycerides. Um, it can work with thyroid. And I'm not going to go into this, but you can look on the reference about thyroid. There's thyroid receptors, all uh, bitter receptors in the thyroid. And it can affect, there's no one study about, there's a great study out there, it's fairly complicated, but um, talks about it can help or hinder the thyroid function. Uh, increases uh, the circulation, it can stimulate endocrine hormones, it can improve digestion, um, increase um, satiety and increase potential of weight loss. And now there's some information about its effect on uh, decreasing inflammation. So that's what I call the new action of bitters. And these are all things that mm, are a little bit beyond what we've typically thought of it. So I'm gonna go through a few studies. These are the taste bitter receptors influence glucose. This is an open access study, so you can look it up. And these are talk about um, T, the TR1s and the twos. These are the bitters, the twos. Um, these uh, findings suggest that a compromised bitter receptor negatively impacts glucose homeostasis, providing an important link. And so here's a study uh, that was also done is that they took obese people and gave them bitters and measured their facial expressions, right? And they found that uh, the more uh, healthy you were, the less bitters were that bad for you. And the more you hated bitters, the more likely you had imbalances. And so I go back to this fact that if I was to take something bitter, this is what my face would do. It would be like, oh, you know, it would taste bad. And so this is the idea that as you get healthier, bitter things in moderation don't taste that bad. And I know all you herb people listening would be like, oh, we love bitter stuff. Or we tolerate it very well. Well, you've developed um, a palate for it, a taste sensation. And bitter, bitters have a range. And so if you start getting into bitters, there's all kinds of ranges. Um, here's a study that shows that the, um, prebiotics can increase, um, they can lessen the sensation of appetite and glucose after a meal. And this talks about um, some of the components that are found in the, the bitter roots, especially. This is a, a study that I'm, you're gonna get a copy of. It's an open access one. This is a son of the incretin hormones as potential targets for type two diabetes. And so this talks about the sugar and the umami receptors and the bitter receptors. And what they really say here is incretins, these are hormones released from the intestines. And so this is kind of uh, another system besides pancreatic hormones. These nutrients combine to affect insulin secretion. And so they basically help lower your blood sugar. So you want as much gut-lined and cretin hormone secretions as you can get because that helps regulate how much insulin you need. They enhance and cretin response um, from the bitter receptor. Several studies have revealed that in cretin secretions from the enteroendocrine, these are the lining of your digestive tract, can be modulated by sweet and inumami and bitter receptors. 
So this is a research article. It's not a, um, an animal or a human study, but it's just saying, and what they point out is that these bitter receptors stimulated by bitter agents may be um, useful in understanding future drug treatments for diabetes and um, metabolic syndrome. We can take it as herbalists and natural practitioners that we know we can use bitters tomorrow and that bitters used long-term can be a tool because they already stimulate these bitter receptors. The basic idea is the pharmaceutical uh, companies are gonna make bitter drugs and they're gonna make them at 100 times the cost of a bitter uh, tincture. That's the nature of uh, pharmaceutical drugs. Um, this is another really fascinating um, study done on gentian. Dr. Nagel? Yes. We have one question. Uh, yeah. So Gigi asks, uh, can bitters aid blood sugar regulation in type 1 diabetics? Uh, it, it's unknown if um, they would be as a helpful. Type 2 is what we really have seen the research on. But some type 1 diabetics, there's a lot of other things in the bitters, like the prebiotics. There's also gentian is super antioxidant high. And some of those things can help systemic effects. And I would say you could go cautious because if you're on insulin, you want to make sure you me measure your blood sugar um, regulation. But it would be unknown, but likely helpful, but probably not to the degree that type 2 diabetes. Um, this study is really detailed. It's really elegant. It's 2015. <clears throat> what they did is they gave animals, <clears throat> rats, 2% um, gentian lutea extracts, and they measured how they could affect um, blood sugar and regulation and how they affect the thickening of the walls. So as you get more placking, they measured that in the animal studies. They also used human placenta cells to measure um, how it affected. Uh, the summaries, oops. Um, the summaries basically show that, I thought I had a slide in there, but I don't see it right here. The summaries show that basically um, it helped lower cholesterol and, uh, and uh, affected blood sugar. And so in the study, what they had done is they had made rats diabetic, and then they gave them either the gentian root or isovintexin, which is a flavonoid from the root. And both of those, once they were diabetics, lowered their response to um, the, uh, blood sugar. So their A1Cs went down. And so what that's showing is that rats that were made diabetic, given gentian, became less diabetic. It also showed lipids go going down. And so, again, you can take what you want from animal studies, but it also showed that the thickness of the walls in the diabetic rats were very thick because placking is part of the diabetic syndrome. And they found that with the gentian, the placking was significantly reduced. Now, we can only take so much from animal studies, but it's a very elegant study showing actually how much power the gentian has. And then they like to say in the end that basically gentian is also filled with a lot of antioxidants, and that has the potential, that's what in re a reference to type 1 diabetes, is antioxidants also will help a chronic host of diseases that aren't just related to diabetes. So these are two studies that you'll get a copy with in the notes. And again, they support this concept. Let's talk a little bit about dosing of bitters. Generally, um, depending on the form, a tea, a tincture, a capsule, tasting is good. What, what I like to do with capsules, if you have a bitter formula that's in the capsules, here's what I like to do with them is open them up, open up one of the capsules, drop it into the bottle, the powder, shake it up. And then what you're doing is you're getting the bitter on the outside of every capsule. And then you get the taste as well as the digestive effect. And I think the more you can get both effects, the better it is. Now, if you're taking a tincture, you're, you're going to get both of them. But generally, a small amount, you know, 30 drops would be maybe a big, depending on how strong the extract is, um, 15 drops. 
every every uh, before meals. That's why keeping a bottle of it on the table, it's just like they're eating, take some in some water, put it directly in your mouth. Again, before or after. Um, and then do it longer. I like this concept of the 30 day. No, that's that's the face right there. All right. <laughs> that's the bitter face. Um, the 30 day bitter challenge is the concept that um, have, have a client or a patient do it for 30 days before you really make a sense of how it's helping or hurting. If you do it every between or before every meal for 30 days, you should really get a sense of how is their digestion affected. And you can go up and down. One of the things I found is that there's this concept I call the bitter shudder. So like when you take a bitter um, substance, if it gets so bitter, you'll just literally almost do like a, a, a like you would do when you're cold. That would be a, a really strong bitter response. A mild bitter response would be kind of like this kid's face. Oh, just yuck. Um, the other thing about bitters is people tend to um, tolerate them for so long and then they need a break. And so one thing that I found is it's good to have a bunch of different types of bitters. And we're going to go over in a second the wise woman bitter formulas because uh, if you have one, two, three different kinds of bitters, you can alternate them and people's, uh, the novelty of a new formula or a new flavor of bitters, you know, there's uh, uh, citrus bitters, there's grapefruit bitters, there's orange bitters, you know, all the different flavors will give people um, ability to keep taking them longer. So the summary of bitters is that they can affect blood sugar and lipids by the incretin effect. Um, they can affect cardiovascular lipids by lowering uh, blood sugar and insulin. They can support a healthy inflammation response, meaning they can help inflammatory diseases. They may be a help, again, there's no magic bullet in obesity and weight issues, but they can help them digest their food, feel more full, get a full complement of minerals and proteins, and then be more satisfied and eat less. That's the theory of I have that it works. They can balance thyroid dysregulation, and they can decrease the cravings for alcohol. So we're gonna bring and talk a little bit about some of the wise women. All right, thank you, Dr. Nagel. So Wise Woman Herbals has some uh, pre-formulated compounds that have many of the wonderful single herbs that Dr. Nagel mentioned um, during his presentation today. Uh, bitter tonic is one of my favorites. It's a very simple uh, bitter formula. It is a liquid extract. It promotes normal, healthy appetite and digestion. Next, we have... Oh, I gotta do it. Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, bittersweet elixir. This is another favorite of mine. Um, so this is particularly nice because it doesn't have as high of alcohol content and the strong bitter taste is is not there like it would be in the bitter tonic. So um, again, this will promote healthy appetite and digestion. There's also some cooling herbs in there. Um, there's some slippery elm. Um, there's some uh, turmeric. So this is another great one to add. Again, if you're looking for something that's not as strong in flavor and in alcohol. And, and I would add that this is really good for the, um, the, uh, the, the bitter novice, as you would call it, like a senior, somebody that's not an herbal medicine person that's never tried bitter things because the, bit, the, the, the um, sweet and bitter balancing them up. And because it's a little less concentrated in the bitters, it's more palatable. Yes. So you could do it more frequently. If you had a child that you wanted to use bitters, this would be the kind of thing to use for them. Thank you, Dr. Nagel. Next we have the GI capsules. So this is based on Robert's formula from the 19th century. And this promotes healthy integrity and function of the gastrointestinal tract. And lastly, we have the digest tea. So this is nice because if you if you have a patient that doesn't want to take pills, that doesn't necessarily want to take a tincture, you can have them take this lovely tea um, that soothes and supports normal. Uh, I'm sorry, it soothes and supports normal he healthy digestive function. 
Um, and I would say, say about the tea, what's great about the tea is that um, this you can use as a base to add bitters in. And so yes. uh, inherently this doesn't have one of the most potent bitters. So this is more like the, the aromatics that go into the bitters. Mm -hmm. So if you had a straight gentian tincture and you put the tea of this and added a few drops of the tincture into this, you would have a very um, complete formula. And Absolutely. what you have to remember about the digestive um, carminative herbs like mint and fennel and citrus is that the little flavor components, terpenes that are found in there, what the terpenes do is they're antispasmodic, they're promoting um, less gas and bloating. And the way they really work is um, because terpenes are like monoterpenes are really small. And um, what happens is they actually are aromatized right through the gut wall into the bloodstream. And what they do is they help absorption by moving excess of gas into the bloodstream and lessening it in the bowels. And so they're thought of, I think of them as, as kind of transport molecules. They move the compound comp components into the bloodstream. And so they make everything more effective absorption. Now, many of you have heard of stuff like uh, black pepper helps absorption. Well, it's because the uh, carophylline and the myrcene and um, the terpenes in there that are very pungent that will drive uh, up, uptake and absorption. And so using um, these aromatic terpenes with bitters is, is a classic way to improve the benefit and the digestibility and the taste. So that would and, be great. And we do have one question. Can alcohol in bitter tinctures affect uh, people with liver disease? This is from Carolina. All right, let's express this issue around alcohol. And that is that uh, most of your tinctures are 45 to 60% alcohol. And so if you think about giving that to somebody that has an alcohol intolerance or is an alcoholic or has religious or social other reasons, that's a no-no. And so that's where um, the teas, most of the bitter substances are dissolvable in water and or alcohol. So you can make a bitter tea or a glyceride out of bitter substances. But the amount of alcohol for the average person, and this would be in relation to children, is very minuscule. If you think about 15 drops, 30 drops of a tincture, you know, and if it's, for, say it's 50% alcohol, then you're getting 30 drops, you're getting 15 drops of alcohol. And if you put it in hot water, probably half of that is reduced. The issue for some people is that they don't know there's alcohol or the smell and taste of alcohol, especially for um, alcoholics can be problematic. But with liver disease, um, it's probably not a good thing, but the amount of alcohol in there is so small that I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't say it's problematic because the effects of the bitters is gonna be very, very, very helpful. But like an example with that would be uh, milk thistle is bitter, but it also has the liver protective effects. It would be very much indicated in chronic liver disease, but you probably wouldn't want to do a tincture dose because you might have to dose uh, mills instead of droppers, and then you start getting uh, a lot of alcohol. We have one more question from Gigi. Can you get the bitters you need from food, i.e. eating dandelion greens, burdock, etc.? I would say this, that yes, especially if you're growing the right in your garden or you have uh, farmers, uh, you know, like in our markets, they have the dandelion greens. Actually, when you buy dandelion greens in the store, they're not dandelion. They say that, but they're actually chicory, a form of chicory. And they're still bitter, but real dandelion greens are really bitter. And I would say eating bitter foods is very good for the healthy to the uh, slightly imbalanced. Once there's a lot of pathology, you may need components that are much bitter. And so I would look at the food as being a way to, if I ate a bitter salad a little bit, I would skip the dose of the liquids or the capsules that, you know. Um, but if somebody really had some chronic issues like diabetes, um, you know, just taking a little bitters in the form of a salad, like artichokes. Artichoke leaf is extremely bitter and that can be used as a food also. A European model, they would the, uh, the ribs and they would make that into a salad. 
Um, so the answer to that question is short is, uh, yes, it can be helpful. Just consider it to be like a mild version, unless you're eating something like, you know, Oregon grape or. Okay, thank you so much. Um, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to uh, type them into the chat box. Um, otherwise, you're at this point, uh, we have finished the presentation, so you're also welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Um, here's my contacts and wise women's contacts. Yes, if you have a, a question and you, can they unmute themselves or do we have to unmute them? Um, they should be able to unmute themselves. Yes, and you know we'd like to uh, have time here so that you can ask questions uh, in relation. So please, if somebody has a question in relation uh, to this topic. Okay, we have one more question. Uh, are bitters contraindicated if a patient gets reflux with coffee? Um, well, coffee is, in most cases, one of the most common bitters people drink on a daily basis. So coffee has a couple things going for it, plus and minus. Coffee has bitters, it has acids, and it has caffeine and, and some tannins. And so, uh, you know, there were uh, people that like black coffee tend to like the taste of bitters. When you add milk to coffee, the bitters are reduced by the, sh the fat and milk, as well as the tannins are reduced. And so people that like coffee with milk probably don't like bitters as much. Um, what was the question again I was getting toward? Sure. Um, it is, are bitters contraindicated if a patient gets uh, reflux with coffee? Um, I would be cautionary and just go slow, meaning, um, what I've seen with clinically with bitters is that for some people, they improve reflex right away. I can remember somebody a few weeks ago that took some bitters and they had reflux and immediately disappeared. The theory on um, reflux is this, that you need this much acid to digest your food and you need this much bicarbonate so your stomach does not digest itself. So when you have reflux, you can have two things going on. You can have too much acid or more likely too little bicarbonate layer. And the bicarbonate layer is parasympathetic stimulated. And so like, you know, rest and repose and having a nice meal makes you have a buffer. And so um, many people that have low bicarbonate layer and normal acid can have reflux. And when you take the bitters, that seems to help stimulate um, the mucus layer. And so those people would do well with it. If we know for sure they're excessive acid, and that's hard to determine clinically, it'd be a judgment call, then bitters might be more um, cautionary, meaning, you know, have them cut off their coffee a little bit, introduce some bitters instead of coffee and see how it happens. The good thing about reflux is it's very quick to determine if they take the bitters and it gets worse, then you know you probably need more soothing digestive and like that herbal tea or uh, anything with slippery elm, any of the demulsants would be first line. Uh, licorice root is your classic uh, demulsant for uh, reflux. So do a few weeks of that therapy, then reintroduce the bitters. Next, uh, Jamie asks, are bitters contraindicated in a person with a hiatal hernia? Um, I would use the same thought on that as um, not necessarily so, but determine how that person is. I would say that in most cases, they can be helpful because if we think of hiatal hernia as a structural issue with the stomach coming up, um, if we can get less bloating in the stomach, better digestion, there's going to be less upward pressure. And upward pressure is what creates the hiatal hernia. And so a classic example is somebody drinks soda and they immediately start belching and, and burping, or um, they eat a lot of um, carbohydrate-rich foods that are churning in the stomach and making stomach um, digestive gas that goes up. You got to remember, gas in the stomach will go up. 
in the in small intestine and the large intestine, it goes out, down. And so I would think a small amount of bitters would, would help the hy hyaline hernia if it's related specifically to pressure upward on the stomach. If they have a really large opening of their esophagus and that's structural and the stomach just comes through, bitters are probably less helpful for that. But if it's more a functional, and a lot of the functional uh, chiropractors and naturopaths can do <coughs> adjustments on, on hiatal hernias, and the functional hiatal hernia bitters would be uh, very helpful. Our next question comes from Nicole Jenkins, and she asks, is there any research around bitters and asthma that you have seen? Yes. Um, if you uh, PubMed bitters receptors in the lungs, you'll find uh, uh, three or four studies that were done, I think around 2000. And the one thing they found, first of all, was why was there bitter receptors in the lung? And what they found is that they're specially located in the bronchi, you know, going into the lung. And um, the theory was, if you were exposed to bitter things that the bitter receptors could cause the lungs to constrict and prevent you from inhaling bitter smoke. But many of you herbalists will uh, remember or have thought of this use of herbal smokes for asthma, right? <clears throat> the classic example is mullen, using mullen to smoke for asthma. Now, how does smoking an herb help asthma? You think it would be a, a, a contraindication? Well, the bitter receptors, now the theory has been shown to be true that when you inhale bitter substances like from mullen, the bitter receptors are stimulated in the lungs and they cause vasodilation. They open. And so I have personal clinical experience. I had a friend I was working with who had a, an allergy to cats. And we went into a house one day and he didn't know there was a cat there and he immediately in, uh, got an asthma attack. And for whatever reason, he didn't have his inhaler. And so I said, well, I just read this research about bitters and lungs. And so I gave him some bitters in his mouth and you can't really inhale liquids, but if you had some mullen or some bitters, you could take a puff of that. And he took some of the gentian and he held it in his mouth and he said it felt like he had just taken his inhaler. And since then, I've seen it work for people to help asthma attack. Now, the question is how to. I think the model that I would use now, the technology is available, is I would take um, a bitter herb, mullen, um, maybe centurium leaf, uh, leaf's probably better, or even gentian root. You can put it in a vaporizer and you can inhale the vapor of that, and that might be very good without having the combustion products of the smoke. You have to remember, uh, if you absorb it in the lungs, it goes into the bloodstream immediately, you get a quick effect. And so these bitter receptors have a vasodilating effect, and there's three or four studies that are really worth looking at. Our next question comes from Donna Stearns, and she asks, what is the best use of bitters for folks transitioning to a keto diet? Well, in the keto diet, they're, they're taking the carbohydrates out and the sugars, and the sugars and carbohydrates are like easier to digest. And so fats inherently and proteins need acid. And so I would say that for most people, adding bitters into their meals when they're digesting protein and fat rich foods will improve the absorption and assimilation of those ingredients. Um, it's not like they won't help carbohydrates, but if you think about proteins, you've got to really work them, you've got to digest them, you've got to break them down into amino acids. And so one of the things you can determine in a clinical model is if patients have a lot of gas, they have a lot of bloating and belching. I think of carbohydrate intolerance. If they have a lot of downward farting and it's basically smells strong, it's, it's, uh, it's the kind of the maldigestion of proteins and fats. 
and that tends to lead to really um, sulfur smelling components and bitters would help either carbohydrates or proteins and fats but specifically for the keto is they're transitioning off of sugars into ketosis and bitters can be very very helpful the other thing about bitters is that you, i talked about 30 days but 10 day window is really the minimum you have to do for them and then often people need a break and then they go back on and so alternating bitters with the time off because what you want to see is you want the body to start picking up some of that slack if bitters stimulate digestion then you want to give people a break and see if they can just naturally um, eat bitter foods or uh, make the kinds of digestive enzymes they need without the use of bitters. So one thing you'll find about bitters is that you will get very poor compliance if they're oral and you want them to do them for long, long periods of time. I, I kind of think of it like garlic. You can only eat so much garlic and then your garlic overburn. And so uh, 10 days for garlic, 10 days to 30 days for bitters, give them a break. And oftentimes they find they can use less. And so there is that sensitization is that these are chemoreceptors, they're stimulating receptors. Can the receptors be overstimulated and not work? I know from my own experience that you can tolerate bitters the more you take. And so I don't know how many people have tasted wormwood, but wormwood is extremely bitter. If you take a lot of wormwood, most people will throw up immediately. But in my own experience is over time, I was able to take more and more. And so I think there is a tolerance to bitters. And so giving breaks, and this is a general trend for all herbal medicine, giving breaks allows the body to like respond in a new healthy way and, and respond so that you don't have to necessarily. And this is the difference between the physiological prescribing and the pharmacological prescribing. Pharmacological says, you know, it's going in there and it's stimulating a receptor and lowering blood pressure. Physiological says it's going in there and warming the circulation, opening things up, moving the blood, but not working on such a specific way. Now, bitters have a, a, almost a pharmaceutical lock and key, but the physiological effect, because you're giving such a small dose, is uh, much more likely. So, a large dose of bitters will be pharmacological, and the number one people thing people will get with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So if you now, get bitters, people feel that way, you gotta lessen the dose. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nagel, we're almost at time, but we just have one last question, um, and that is if there's any information out there on bitters and seizures, as well as parasites. I have not, and I, I've studied bitters for the last two years pretty extensively. I have not seen anything on seizures. I would say that parasites might be worth a PubMed check, but we know that the classic bitters, like wormwood, was used for worms. And so what I think happens is that uh, as bitters stimulate more acid, you have to remember that as you eat food and goes in your mouth, it's going through you, but it's not going in you. And so uh, if you have leaky gut or if there's bacteria on the food, you need acid to sterilize your food. And so bitters will help that. And so um, being exposed to amoebas, parasites, bad bacteria, if you don't have enough acid, you can get leaky gut, you can get SIBO. And so I would say that um, Definitely as a prevention, bitters can be very, very helpful. But depending on the uh, condition, bitters could be a treatment for parasites because of the natural connection between antiparasitic herbs um, and bitter agents. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagel. Uh, we are just about at time. So we wanted to let everyone know that there is a special promotion for everyone who attended today. Um, you will be receiving 15% off of your uh, entire order and that's off of wholesale pricing starting today, the 19th, all the way through February 1st. So um, when you call into customer service, make sure you give them the code LC119 to take advantage of that offer. And in case you don't have customer service uh, telephone number, that is 
If you don't have an account with us, please feel free to give them a call and they'll be happy to set that up for you. You can also uh, reach us through our website. There's some contact information and uh, ways that you can open an account through our website. And uh, like Dr. Nagel mentioned, uh, he has his contact information here. If you have any questions that come up either tonight or at some point, uh, he'll be more than happy to answer those for you. So his information is here on the slide. We will be providing that in the thank you email as, as well. Um, again, our contact information at Wise Women Herbals is here. Um, look out for that email in the next 48 hours with the replay link. Uh, all the slides will be listed on, on that email. Um, any studies that he mentioned today will be on that email and then all the information on the promotions today. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you on our next call. Yes, and the next one is in February. What's the date, Asmin? Uh, let's see. We're doing another, we're doing a practitioner call or a webinar every month and so in, um, February, we're doing another practitioner call on, um, I believe that's on stress and anxiety, or no, that's March. March, we're doing a webinar, and if you're a practitioner, we're going to be giving you one hour of CEUs, continuing education units, uh, for that webinar in March. I will actually send out the exact date in that email, so we'll send you the information for February and March's event, as well as some information on how to register for those. All right, remember, try the bitters, really safe, really tasty, once you get to be able to handle it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Nagel. Thanks so much. Take care.